I think we're getting ready to start again. I think we've already touched upon so many issues and concerns that I feel we could just call it quits now and then we, <laughs> we have enough to think about for the rest of the year. Um, I was thinking about hearing your very different presentations. I was uh, thinking about how, for me at least, how intrinsically ethics is linked with trust. Uh, trust between institutions and stakeholders, trust between institutions and artists, artists and curators and so on. Um, and I, I, I got to thinking about small, uh, something that happened to me quite a few years ago, because before I worked at Orga, I worked at an art institution in Odense, which is a provincial town here in Denmark. And I came from working in Copenhagen within, within a professional field here. And I was at a meeting with the local city council, and I was incredibly stupid, so I was speaking about the importance of the arm's length principle. <laughs> which I don't know uh, about, about you guys who come from outside of Scandinavia, but the idea of the arm's length principle, it's sort of like, it's like a biblical sentence in the <laughs> Scandinavian cultural politics traditionally. And I'll never forget, then I sat next to the guy who was on the city council for the Social Democrats and he poked me with his pen and then he said, we don't believe in that kind of stuff here, little lady. <laughs> and, yes, and, but, and, it's, but, and even though that sounds extremely harsh, it was such an important lesson for me because it really got me thinking about, as they were sort of touching about, I mean, the normative standards which we automatically assume are in place for everyone uh, and, and how differently we sort of read and interpret ethical codes of conduct. What I would like to, to ask you about collectively, and I know it's a like, broad, huge question, was that uh, Dave was also addressing the fact that, that how do we avoid this, this sort of ethical turn, this ethical uh, linguist language we're already developing, also developing at a conference like this, into becoming like a new normative standard for the art institutions. Because I think we all know, all of us working in this field at least, that, I mean, capitalism, a critique of capitalism, it's like the status quo of art institutions. It's like, it's something you do because then you become a respectable art institution somehow. <laughs> How do, we, how do we also, as Dave was addressing, how do we turn ethics into politics as institutions and not just something that we address on, on conferences like this? What is, how does the ethical art institution actually behave in practice? Can you take us? <laughs> Dave, maybe you would like to start off with a few bits. Um. <coughs> It's not working. Um, the, the, the thing that struck me when, when, when you were asking that question is, <clears throat> is how the, is the difference between having an ethical set of principles, just having them, like thinking that these are God-given, someone said earlier on today, you know, the, these, are the, these are the values that you have and these are the values that maybe your parents have and so on and so on. That, that, I'm thinking of that as ethics. And then this other kind of ethical living, which is about constantly questioning your values and your norms. And I think that, in a sense, you, you could say that this conference could fall into one or the other of those. You know? is, this, is this the kind of event where we pat ourselves on the back and say, yes, our ethical values are the ethical values, and then we can just come away from here continuing to do what we've always done, you know? Um, <clears throat> or do we think of uh, events like this, but also the kind of processes that we're going through all the time in, in our institutions? Are those, are those processes alive in, in an ethical sense? So, you know, um, Alistair, is uh, earlier on said, was asked about what about repatriating all that stuff that you've got in, in London? Um, and, and he gave what was, to all intents and purposes, an ethical answer to that. We care about these objects too much to give them to places that can't look after them. That's, there's an ethics to that answer. But there's also a different kind of ethics to, in, in, in effect, saying this isn't the perfect solution for us. Or, or saying, we would rather give them back. We think that's the ethical thing to do. 
but we have these practical problems to face first. So, so in a sense, there's a kind of there's a, there, there's the ethical position of saying we are justified in what we do. We 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 thought about this and we come up with this solution. And then, but then there's another kind of ethics, which is to which is much more kind of fragile than that, which is admitting that the kind of things that you're forced to do are not necessarily things that you think you ought to do. I think, um, well, you can talk about this at so many levels, so let me go to a more sort of, um, you know, uh, practical or everyday level from the perspective of, you know, being the one who's responsible for fundraising. I think very often the ethical issues appear in connection with how do we fund our projects, because um, um, I think that's actually where you create the framework for the art to really be presented. And, and I mean, I think we should never compromise with the art. It's all about art. I mean, it's about the artists to make the framework for the artists to really sh do the, what they are good at. And sometimes that's make, making the everyday life of a museum difficult. That, that's part of that. But I mean, as a leader or the, or the institution, it's really your job to create the framework for that. And doing that, you, you get into all these ethical um, dilemmas when you negotiate with political frameworks or with the private foundations or with, you know, like in Kyu, where we have a city development um, project going on um, and artists are asked to take part. And, and what is it that, that they want from the artists? We as the curators and the institution have to negotiate that before, you know, we allow the artists into the arena. And, and then they can be confronted with what happens. And we have several examples of absurd situations where artists have met you know, with these city developers, just one example was Christian Schmidt Rasmussen, who is a Danish painter, and we had a big wall in 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 Kyu, 34 meters long and four and a half meters high, and they wanted something nice on the wall, and they went to us since we are the museum, the art museum, and said, yeah, sure, that's really a good idea, and they said, yeah, we want something about the vision for the future of the city, and I said, okay, I have the perfect painter. Um, and then we brought Christian and, and we were all three parts together and they told him this idea, you know, we want you to paint, you know, the vision, the future, the utopia of the city on the wall. And then he said, okay. And he looks like kind of, you know, he fell down from the moon and he looked at them and then he said, yeah, you know what? When I look into the future, I see nothing but, you know, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, okay, that's your guy. You should take him. And they did because they had a, they had trust with us. But that's really so strong of him to say that. And not so yeah, I always paint in red and blue and yellow and we're really nice and blah blah blah. So that was just a really critical point, you know, where you said, okay, we are the three parts and we we make this agreement, we do it. But it's also great from their side that they trust us to let him do that. You know what I mean? That's just an example. I think it's a really, really difficult challenge, and, and uh, I know where um, the city where my institution is uh, situated. Um, they build a lot of housing these days, and um, one fact is that they actually use our institution or the museum or the art institution to help to, you know, gentrify an area. So only by being there, only by you know working with with art, you're you're, um, you're there, you know, whether you want it or not, as part of um, an ethical dilemma. Um, I think that um, reinventing institutions as, uh, have been the topic this afternoon from Q, for example, implies, uh, as, as you also uh, to, talked about, to have a lot of conversations with external uh, stakeholders and that is a move that forces institutions to um, to reconsider uh, basic uh, uh, understandings of what an institution is. So I think that is a move that uh, already prevents institutions from you know having an ethics that is uh, inwardly and so on. It, and it reminds me of. Um, 
uh, at the moment I'm I'm collaborating with um, a project in Aarhus called Helhedsplanen, which is a, a development of an area that is uh, a ghetto. Um, and um, I'm having conversations with the people uh, leading this uh, development on how to use, how to spend their uh, one percentage of uh, art in this. And it's, it's quite um, paradoxical because uh, my motivation for entering this project is to um, make, uh, create some kind of awareness of how art can enter a project in a kind of extradisciplinary fashion, trying actually to work close together with the transformation of the area, which is a part of it. Uh, and, and what uh, I've const, um, you know, um, I've seen that uh, when we have meetings, uh, the people uh, leading the projects with our politicians and the people living there and um, the stakeholders, they have uh, these very conventional ideas of what art should do. <laughs> so they start off saying, oh, we have this wall and we have this wall and, you know, suggesting that this is where art could be applied, whereas I, I have this idea of, well, where could we, uh, what kind of platforms could we enter into and engage with what is already happening there and so on. So it, it, when you try and, and transgress uh, uh, traditional ideas of what institutions are and do, you, um, you kind of um, uh, enter into a lot of conversations. <laughs> Um, maybe also in order to, to create more of a common ground for discussion, it might also be the time to just slightly address the question of national differences, which of course also plays a lot a, a big role in this. Because, um, for instance, Bettina, I know that in Sweden many of the small and mid-sized institutions are primarily publicly funded, whereas here in Denmark mostly are approaching like increasingly private funding. I mean, we're sitting in a conference here today, completely paid for by a bank. I mean, it's, it's not, there's not a, a drop of, of government funding in this conference. Um, so, so maybe it's also... I'm leaving now. <laughs> so maybe it's also a question for, for you, Sina, um, and, and, and knowing your research in the field, how does national differences between, between sort of the role of public versus private funding play a part in how, institu how the institutions uh, sort of address this this ethical shift that you are address, addressing in your in your research, mm. or how do they? I, I haven't been looking into uh, funding. That I haven't been looking into the role of funding. Okay. Actually. Okay. And the difference between private and public funding. But maybe then it would be a good question for you, Bettina and Christina, to address how you think that this plays a role. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe for me, I think it's um, you know natural that the state should fund um, the art institutions. So, so maybe that's also why we have you know different presentations, probably. Uh, well, I mean, we work, we we uh, we work from from um, yeah we have different perspectives, but um, but that's my. Um, my hope is that it, it can still, um, I mean, the majority of the money should come from the state to guarantee that everyone uh, can take part in culture. And I think that's a democratic uh, issue. And it's really, really important. That's why, I mean, we have to really, you know, stand up for ourselves. And, and um, you know, because we are many. Together we can sort of, you know, bring this up to a higher level. Um, I just want to mention, because I didn't do that in the presentation, but um, uh, we have uh, our network in Sweden are now collaborating with um, uh, the training for Kunsthalle Denmark. Yeah, in, in, in Denmark and, and, and also in Norway. So we have uh, the goal of uh, putting up a big symposium in 2017, where we hope to uh, also have a lot of, of uh, the politicians, um, bureaucrats and everyone and we need a lot of um, speakers that could uh, touch upon this subject from, from many different perspectives. Um, I don't know yet. Yeah, um, 
I totally agree that the welfare state is not a welfare state if it doesn't support the cultural institutions. Full stop. I mean, um, I think maybe we've been looking with great admiration at Sweden, and especially at your network of smaller and mid-sized uh, institutions for contemporary art, that we don't have we don't have the same strong network in Denmark. Um, we have very strong institutions, but they are maybe, they are not so, I mean, spread out as they are here uh, in Sweden. And I think that it's really sad to hear that, but of, of course it's not very surprising, but it's, it's, I think it's important that you stand up and fight for them. And I think it's a great idea to, to produce a report like you did. And I was also curious to hear how the political reaction had been because I really think it's true also with my experience from being the chair of the, all the museums in Denmark, not only the art museums, but the historical and the natural uh, historical museums, that when we got together and really spoke with one voice, we had enormous impressions so and we really had an impact on the new law that was made during that time. And we had our fingerprints put on the law. And it's possible if, because if you are that strong and you all go together instead of competing, then they can't, you know, the politicians, they, they have to listen. So you, you, you really should do your political work, um, your lobbyism, your, your agendas, it, it is possible. The problem with art is that it's so difficult to, to with the rhetorics of, you know, usefulness, and it's, you can't go there. You can't go into that discussion of what is art better than a hospital or, you, you can't go there, you, you should avoid it. You should stick to the, the the idea that a welfare society without strong cultural institution is not a welfare society. I think we should fight for that, that's my hope. But I think also in Denmark we are depending on it, the private foundations. And I also think it's good because I think the state is also very strong in its you know, ideas about how the institutions should be institutions and what agendas they should have. And I think it's good to have competition from other funding paths because that means that we, we don't have kind of a you know, overruling um, state that dictates what we should do in institutions. <coughs> um, uh, operating in, in England, I'm very, um, very close to some of the uh, members of, um, um, of the, the people protesting against big oil sponsoring the arts. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from one of them saying, uh, we're going onto the radio, we've been asked to talk about uh, our campaign against all sponsorship for the arts. We'd like you to come on and, and speak uh, on our behalf on the radio. And I said, I'll come onto the radio and speak against corporate sponsorship of the arts, but I'm not going to come onto the radio and speak about only oil sponsorship of the arts. As if, you know, getting rid of the oil sponsorship will not now suddenly mean that we're clean. Okay, so what I, what I want to do is come on the radio and talk about building a campaign to eradicate all corporate sponsorship from the arts. And, they, and, and this guy said at the other end of the phone, we'll call someone else. <laughs> um, so one, of, so one of the problems is that the, the kind of ethics we've got around sponsorship of the arts at the moment picks some companies as being unethical and other companies as not being unethical. Um, and it also has that kind of logic of, um, of contagion. You know, if that company does awful things over there, then, then me taking their money somehow, something else comes along with the money. So now I've been contaminated by this ugly thing that, that happened somewhere else, which, which, which to me is based on a, on a very flawed concept of money. So if, 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 we, if, we, if, if we push that further, if we say that money coming from the bank, for instance, if we stop at the bank, then you don't understand money because the bank gets its money from somewhere else. So where does, it get, where does the money come from before the bank? And where does it come from before that? And where does it come from before that? Where does all money come from? And if you're a Marxist, I'm, I happen to be a Marxist, then, you, then your understanding of it, my understanding of it is, all money is produced by labour. So there can't be any money produced in any other way from that theory. So, um, so what that means to me is all money is clean. 
because all money has been produced by someone and their life force. So I've got no problem with accepting money. What I've got a problem with is, is how this giving of money by a company or a bank or whatever it is, is then taken to be a sign of their enlightenment. So it's the semiotics of that that is problematic, not the actual receiving of money. Do we have any questions? Or are you all so worn out by all of these complex issues right now? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for very interesting talks. I thought your question was very interesting and it made me think about how political movements have influenced art institutions and their awareness of representation of different cultural backgrounds and gender. And I wanted to ask you, specifically Christina and Bettina, how you view your role as an art institution in a political way. Do you think about how your art institution can represent different um, people in a way that reflects society's focus on these issues. And that I think that goes well with ethic, ethics as well, because we have an idea that the political awareness is ethical. Yeah, of course, yeah, we, we do. We do think about these things, and, and um, uh, there, there is, there's a huge need for things to change, absolutely, and um, um, if we were to be really fair, we would all give up our positions and uh, replace them with people that could represent the society uh, in a more, um, in a better way. Um, so there's a lot, lot of things to do. What, what we do uh, with, you know, in, in our representation of artists, we, we think of, of those things there, both in terms of gender and, and uh, of, of uh, representation from different uh, backgrounds and so on. But I think the, the most problematic is the people who, who work in the institutions. They are mainly uh, from one background, actually. And uh, that's going to be uh, a big problem. Uh, in the future. And so are artists actually at work as well. I remember when I worked with the Art Academy, a study came out that showed that 75% of Scandinavian arts and the students came from a higher middle class background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we're showing as well. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Uh, but but uh, people are starting to think about this also in, in the art academies. Uh, so sl very slowly, I think, just as the, you know, the. Um, the women, the movement, you know, with the feminism, it's going to take a while, but um, probably get there too. Yeah, uh, we think the same way, and I think you're right that the organizational issues are the most mm, difficult ones. I was just so inspired last week when I heard about the newspaper in Denmark, Information, that had a whole uh, paper written by journalists who were actually sitting around in the Danish refugee camps waiting for, you know, some kind of solution and I mean I think that was such a strong uh, thing to do uh, it was a of course you should say a good really great issue and they had different angles in the agenda so we were very surprised that you know yeah these people had completely different angles and you know I think that was such an inspiring you know example of a, of, a, of a, an institution or an organization or also a business that really lets go all the control and invites other people's voices in so I think yeah, just I think that in relation to working in a mixed economy and working under conditions in which uh, corporate funding is a, a basic uh, condition, uh, also uh, that actually Bernard's idea of virtuosity can be used here because he distinguishes between what he calls servile virtuosity, which is the kind of virtuosity that I tried to point out here, but then he also operates with something called profanating virtuosity, which is the kind of uh, virtuosity uh, that uh, that um, that is uh, politically um, potentially radical. And I think, for, to give a concrete example of this, uh, again, my experience with the Healers Plan at Gellor, 
uh, they uh, have this great idea that uh, they would uh, they have an, a, a very cheap offer of buying some light equipment and technologies and they have this idea that we could uh, project this up into uh, the kind of rebuilding the whole area and they could project it up onto to this uh, crana, what's that in English? Cranes. Cranes. And, um, and I think that the way in which you can, you can work politically virtuous in this kind of um, atmosphere is by uh, taking the, accepting the idea but trying to turn it into something that has a potential, uh, a revolutionary potential and, and see, well, um, because obviously that's a, it, what is be seeming attractive about this light event is that it is creating some kind of spectacular event. And so I think it's just we have to get used to working under these conditions in which we need to think creatively about how to, um, how to employ these means in a more politically um, potent way. So, uh, so maybe you could use the crane project for something that is actually um, connecting to the community out there and uh, you know learning people's program and uh, using <laughs> light for programming and so I think it's not a, an either or it's not back to old arm length principle or compromise with covert forces. Well, if there aren't any final questions or remarks, Janne? I have a comment. You had to wait. <laughs> uh, Christina had a very good example about negotiations between uh, the painter and your institution, and it was also politicians, and it could have been companies too. And uh, Reine was uh, talking about trust. But I think uh, uh, the main issue here is that when persons are in negotiation, it is very really important that people are honest about their different interests. And, and the problem about trust, it is when people are saying one thing to, uh, to achieve a goal and they are not honest about uh, what they want. Uh, people have to be very open about their different uh, interests in a negotiation. Then you can have trust. It's the condition. I think that's an extremely beautiful conclusion <laughs> to, to this first day of the conference. Um, I want to say a great big thank you to everybody who has given presentations today and also a big a uh, great thank you for all the interested questions. We're so happy that we can have you all here today. And I hope that we will see you all again tomorrow. Thank you very much.